are like just sitting up there, <laughs> floating. They're, you know, they're not going after the tiny little guys a lot of times. It's the big ones because if you can, if you can force a Google to comply with a set of laws, you're going to have a chilling effect, a demonstration effect for other players. Um, so they, you know, you're really, a, you're juicy <laughs> as a target. <laughs> um, you know, lucky you. Uh, but uh, it raises uh, related uh, concerns about differences between laws with regard to personal jurisdiction, choice of law, the enforcement of judgments, uh, including technological en enforcement and so on. And among powerful states, increasingly it seems to be that there's a certain mutual interest in affirming each other's sovereignty claims and uh, being responsive to the demands of other countries' local laws. So you get the U.S. courts, for example, in the Yahoo case, saying the French courts have the right to make this, this claim. Okay, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back on this kind of point. As Miriam pointed out, uh, this also comes up in the case of, of kitty porn. I remember back in the, what's going on? Um, no, some, somebody else is on screen. No, you are on screen. Oh, I'm on screen? But I'm hearing a voice. But I'm hearing a voice from there. So that's really, this is really kind of asynchronous. All right, anyway, uh, in the case of kitty porn, I remember back in the early 1990s when the web took off. I was in Washington, D.C., and I used to interact with the Clinton people a lot. And everybody went ape shit, not ape shit, sorry. <laughs> everybody went crazy over a particular problem, which is that, not to embarrass anybody, but in Japan, uh, there was a lot of kitty porn on the internet and it was pretty much widespread and a lot of people in America were getting it and the Clinton White House actually got on the phone with the Japanese government and demanded that they up their standards and the Japanese then began to take all this stuff down etc. You get situations that where one powerful government is unilaterally going to extend its public morality uh, and public order rules globally by putting pressure on other states. Those kinds of situations can happen as well. Um, legal, legal people that I've talked to seem to think that this is going to just increase and that the arguments that foreign publics were not the target and hence cannot control, that they can't control, that Google can't control, who sees uh, posted content and so on, just don't wash anymore because the technology increasingly enables geolocation for advertising and controlling access to licensed material and processing is done in the users, at the user's end, which is within a national jurisdiction. So increasingly the legal people seem willing to recognize the claims of national governments to be able to say, if your stuff is accessible to my citizens, um, we have every right to impose liability, intellectual property, whatever it might be. So Rishi raised the question of, you know, uh, what constitutes passage through a, a boundary and presence in the country? Well, in the context where the technological tools are there to actually cut off that access, the arguments could be made by the courts that, uh, you know, you need to do so and they have every right to make that claim. So this gets then into the problem of balancing mixed interests. You have countries like the United States that defend freedom of speech, but they're also supporting the right of authoritarian governments to adopt policies in terms of surveillance and so on that would seem antithetical to those same values because they want to, be re they want to have their own right to do so recognized. So it gets pretty complicated. And it gets even more complicated when the parties are really divided so that when you have uh, issues like, say, taxation or consumer protection and they can't decide whose rules really should apply, then you have to devise some sort of international framework or something like that. Finally, um, when there's major power disparities involved, I think this is another dimension. It's one thing when it's a conflict of laws between the OECD countries. When it's a conflict of law between the United States, say, and some developing country, there's an ability of powerful states often to sort of just say, we're not going to recognize the, 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 the rulings of your courts or your, or your legislatures. We don't think you're terribly competent, and et cetera. And then what does the small state do? So this is an international power political issue as well. And the last point on this, I would say international economic law becomes a factor that can constrain things here too. A very interesting case was the WTO decision against the United States on gambling in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, where they said basically the US government doesn't have a right to shut down these sites. 
So if you've got international economic agreements that are sort of prohibiting the free exercise of that unilateral authority, then that's a whole other dimension. So my last point, and then I'll stop, all this raises questions for internet governance and how we think about internet governance. The definition of internet governance that we've all sort of agreed is that it's the development and application of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs that shape the internet and its use. Shared. Are there shared rules? Where are there shared rules? What kinds of systems are there for addressing these cross-boundary issues today? If you look at the sources of internet governance that we have now, I would say that there's six. Negotiated intergovernmental rule systems and programs. We have things like the UN Citral uh, model laws and so on. We have the somewhat failed effort of the Hague uh, Conference uh, on, on private law. Uh, but there are other efforts to establish uh, intergovernmental legal frameworks that would address these issues. We have negotiated private sector rule systems and programs, codes of practice among companies in different sectors. And some of these become relevant as companies try to work together to avoid getting to the point of the issue becoming a legal and political conflict. We have negotiated multi-stakeholder rule systems. I don't really think I can name many cases where the applicable treatment of these issues has really been done in a multi-stakeholder setting. We have non-negotiated agreements where you have the unilateral establishment of mechanisms with global reach by powerful states. For example, when the United <laughs> States uh, says we're going to establish ICANN and that's it, or when France says we're going to do this to Yahoo and that's it, those become kind of de facto international norms that apply to lots of players in some cases, even if there's conflicts. And you can similarly have the power of um, non-negotiated agreements, uh, essentially, or not, not agreements, non-negotiated governance emerging from powerful companies. I won't name any, but there are some companies that have, you know, in oligopolistic or monopolistic powers, uh, markets the ability to essentially set rules. Is that a solution to these kinds of questions? And lastly, you have the convergence or mutual recognition of policies between countries and industries. It seems to me that a lot of the way these issues are being addressed today is somewhere between the intergovernmental shared frameworks and unilateral action and this coordinated convergence that goes on as governments work together in a transgovernmental setting as judiciaries work together and as legislatures uh, coordinate and so on. Um, and the question I guess to, to all of you is are these sufficient mechanisms? Are there better mechanisms that we should be thinking about? How does one interject a multi-stakeholder dimension into this to ensure the rights of citizens? Um, there's a lot of big unanswered questions here, but we know going forward that we're going to have more and more of these kinds of cases where these kinds of national actions are going to be projected out into cyberspace and affect more and more players. And when we get to the point where authoritarian governments are making decisions that affect within non-authoritarian countries, people will be particularly sitting up and taking notice. So these are questions just to try to provoke some discussion from all of you. Uh, how do we approach jurisdiction? How do we approach the growing power of the state, the territorialization of the internet, which we now understand is not the great free-for-all that the cyber libertarians told, it would be, told us it would be uh, 15 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I'm very keen now to open up to the floor. I don't think we have enough time to solve all of the problems that have been raised, but we certainly want to get as much uh, input as we possibly can. And I would ask panellists here to, as much as possible, if we need to respond, to keep it very brief, because a lot of people want to... I, I see hands everywhere, and we want to make sure. So, Ronnie, you're... Uh, uh, Ronnie Colvin from the World Press Freedom Committee. And my, my remarks, which was really a question, are addressed to uh, the, our spokesman from Google. Uh, first of all, you need to read that whole article by Jeffrey Rosen in the New York Times magazine. It's very sophisticated, and it may personalize things, but it raises a lot of basic qu uh, quest questions, which make a lot of the considerations that Bill is talking about seem rather moot, because what it does is say, in effect, that the determination of content censorship, in effect, has been privatized for you all at Google. 
And so, I'm bothered by your talking about your methodology, your internal consistency, and internal knowledge of what you're doing. Uh, it raises the whole question about what do we know about transparency? Because Jeffrey Rosen, for example, asked the question when he goes to Google, how many people do you have working, making rulings on content? And Google refuses to, say, to give him that information. Uh, so that, that really raises the question of all these functions that Bill has been describing, in effect already been privatized and passed on to you all. And what are you going to do about making yourself transparent about how you handle these issues? Do you want to respond briefly, Richard? Yeah, uh, just briefly. I think that's uh, I, I think that's really useful feedback. I mean, particularly the point about about transparency. And I think part of today, part of part of the article itself, is an effort to to finally uh, be public about the. Uh, I think we're self-aware about what you're talking about. I think we're very self-aware and anxious about the position, the role we play, the privatization of what uh, what Bill has talked about. And, it, and it's sort of, uh, ad admittedly, what results in kind of this plea uh, for this to no longer be the situation and what leads to uh, these efforts to self-regulate. But I think you're, I think, uh, I'm sure, in the coming uh, months and years, if, if, this, if, if this remains the state of, uh, of uh, internet governance and content regulation and such, I think, uh, and, and, and companies like Google, we're not the only ones, remain as globally popular as we are. We, we do need to think through how, how can we be uh, transparent and, 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 and uh, feed objectivity and representativeness, uh, global representativeness, into our decision-making process. Thanks, Rishi. Um, I see a number of hands, but... Um there's a gentleman here, perhaps, um, and there was somebody over the other side. We've got a couple of microphones, I think. Uh, gentleman back here in the middle, but the floor is yours. Um, me? Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Sergio Suyama. I'm a federal prosecutor in Brazil. Um, we are trying to bring uh, to the IGF the perspective of a developing country uh, regarding this important issue uh, 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 discussed in this uh, working uh, uh, shop, in this workshop. And uh, uh, I think it's important, uh, as Mr. Ishii said, uh, uh, to, to present the context of the problem that we have been facing in these developing countries. Uh, in Brazil, we have 50 million users, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in my country, is uh, uh, a country where the internet is growing faster, like 90, 900 percent, more than uh, uh, like developed countries where the internet is consolidated everywhere. And uh, the most accessed sites in uh, this, uh, in Brazil and uh, also in India and other developing countries uh, uh, are websites provided by. Uh, uh, international companies like Google or Microsoft or Yahoo, uh, who are of course based in the United States. Uh, the, server, the, the services uh, are provided in Portuguese and uh, uh, tailored uh, to the needs and the preferences of the Brazilian society. And uh, as uh, also Mr. Nishi reminded, uh, there's a, a, a um, uh, crimes uh, defined not only to make to commit uh, uh, acts con conducts not uh, consider crimes only uh, by the Brazilian legislation but also uh, under uh, international standards uh, human rights standards like discrimination or child abuse or racism or na na Nazi uh, speech uh, the problem is that uh, when we try to investigate these offenses and ask for uh, the cooperation of local of the local offices of these uh, companies. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, this local office re refused to give us the, the necessary cooperation, uh, arguing that the data are physically located in the United States. And uh, that, uh, for this uh, only reason, uh, the United States legislation
legislation and jurisdiction must be uh, used as uh, uh, to define uh, uh, the conduct as a crime and to define the jurisdiction and the local of the crime. And uh, this uh, uh, perspective, uh, uh, I mean, the, the data, where the data are located, the, 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 this approach, uh, uh, the country of origin approach, uh, def the, deny uh, the necessary protection of human rights in our perspective. That's why we think uh, it's unacceptable uh, uh, this position. But unfortunately, as I said, uh, uh, this position is being uh, uh, arguing by many uh, important international companies, like these three companies that I said mentioned. And uh, 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 just uh, to, to conclude, uh, uh, I think uh, we have to discuss other criteria uh, under uh, which we can use our own legislation in order to cope with this, uh, this, these problems. Of course, we are not we are a democratic country uh, and in trying to, to do the best to promote and to defend human rights. And it's not fair to say, to, to compare us uh, to countries like uh, China or Iran or other uh, authoritarian countries because we are not uh, an authoritarian country. We are not trying to pursue uh, political dissidents or political minorities. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, we are arguing this, this, uh, uh, this uh, position. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think we hear that problem and it's one of the known problems that exists at this point of time that there is no global mechanism to deal with these issues. Should there be? Well, I'm certainly a person who thinks so. I certainly think something has to resolve. I don't know if there's a, a quick comment anybody wanted to make. Yeah. You know, uh, I think this is a good example, uh, to differ a little with Ian, um, where uh, a global formula probably isn't going to help all that much. Um, but as a prosecutor, you know, uh, we have MLAS, multilateral legal assistance treaties. Uh, many countries around the world have them uh, with each other or with, um, uh, with groups of states in a multilateral setting. Um, so, you know, when you need to have state-to-state -state cooperation on law enforcement matters, if there isn't a treaty like the Cybercrime Convention that's applicable, there are mechanisms. But I, w I wanted to comment uh, on your question, also the previous question, because um, I did uh, have time, barely, to finish the Google article by Jeffrey Rosen, and I think one of the interesting points uh, is, is not just to view it through the prism of censorship, but to look at it as um, a company, uh, or, or to look at it in the context of not just Google, but other companies that um, struggle with local law. And in this context, um, the article described how Google views a number of issues in terms of deciding what to do. And one of them is whether the um, purported contact, uh, content is uh, in violation of, of a local law. Uh, and I think, you know, in the case of Brazil, um, that would weigh very heavily, uh, if not be determinative, of the decision. But the article also shows how a company, when it, when it internally, despite, you know, all the human frailties involved, decides that it doesn't really violate local law, uh, they will go to the government and say, we're sorry, but, you know, we don't see the issue here. So I think there's also a story, uh, and not just for Google, but for companies... Of, let me just finish, please. Uh, companies of different nationalities um, who are called in by governments, but don't necessarily comply with the request because they don't consider it to be to be a legitimate one. Difficult issues. Um, Parman, do you have the microphone, I think? Um, uh, somebody else would like to indicate who wanted to speak here? We'll get a... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Uh, it's a very complicated territory and there's so much uh, probability to discuss here. Uh, I would try to classify my comments uh, in, in two groups. One is my comments to private interests who are amassing immense power in the new situation, and another set of uh, comments for the political community who needs to act in uh, those circumstances. Uh, unfortunately, the representative of uh, such private interests here is Google, and nothing against Google. I like Google very much. I use it all the time. Uh, but the fact that it is amassing such immense power uh, is an issue which we are now started to get worried about, all of us. And when a company starts 
be facing their public engagements with the possibility of unproductive discussions, the company should start understanding that they are going into an area where, uh, where they, they, are, they, are, they are going towards amassing such power, absolute power, which is likely to corrupt. I also would like the engagements with Google uh, to be separated into two, two separate areas. One is about the political controls and content regulation, and other are the commercial interests involved. And I think uh, in case of content regulation, it's easier for Google in many ways. They get an easy, easy passage because there's no real conflict of interest. Uh, privately, they all agree that you know everything should be free, and we agree everything should be free, and so let's see how we can sort it out. But I, there's another set of problem of a very different quality is about the commercial interests involved. Now, Google says that its aim is to organize global knowledge. And if they are organizing global knowledge, which they are doing, they're becoming the world's privatized global knowledge system. I need to know what are the principles by which they organize that knowledge. They think those principles. Okay, and I'll just close it. And, and the transboundary aspect of it is the commercial regulation, which is international, which is of a political economy nature, and not just the political cultural nature. And I'm making the counterpoint that those commercial interest issues are as important in transnational jurisdiction as our cultural and political control issues. Yeah, mm. Thank you. Yeah, understood. Thank you, gentlemen. Back here is the microphone. Uh, is there somebody, uh, gentleman over there, if is next? Yeah. Hello, my name's um, Khalid. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Khalid Haddad, I work for the BBC. Uh, we need British. to get the microphone on for you, I don't know what to do. Hi, my, my name's Khalid Haddad, I work for the BBC. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I appreciate the problems uh, highlighted by Rishi regarding applicable law and jurisdictions. I think it applies to all sort of like media companies operating on the internet. Um, but one question I do have, which I think is, uh, you know, it was a decision which Google is responsible for, is its policy on data retention. And how do you decide, you know, what, how long you keep this data, and, and the issues of sort of like privacy, uh, you know, especially your users' privacy, because you've not really discussed it with your users, and you have, you seem to have different sort of like policies in different jurisdictions. I wonder if you can take that one again, you know, as a sort of interesting journalistic question that's not actually to do with transboundary data, but that's a very interesting question, and uh, is this something you can respond to offline? It's sort of a little bit out of scope for where we're trying to concentrate here, I think. But I mean, depending on how you look at it, it's out, out of scope or in scope, but I, what, I, what I will say is privacy is core to our business. Our business falls apart, our service falls apart without privacy. I think you've seen in recent months and years that our, that our privacy policies have, have become industry leading in terms of what we disclose about uh, anonymity uh, or the lack thereof in our, in our procedure. So I'm happy to talk to you about it offline. Very quickly, you know, when I make a comment about argue, uh, unproductive conversation, throughout my remarks I tried to demonstrate self-awareness of what you all might think, which is one, that we're, we're amassing too much power. I agree. I agree. That, that was part of what I'm trying to say. And when I say I, I don't want conversation to uh, deteriorate into argument, it's just, it, it's, it's why I say it up front that we think we have too much power, uh, that we're self-aware of and wanting to be self-aware of the context, that's what I would say. And on the Brazil question, very quickly, I think, uh, you know, you raise a very good point about, and, and the thinking that I provided, it's not 10 years old, it's not five years old, it's really new. And I think part of our experience in Brazil has really helped inform us as to what ought to be the criteria that we think about in these very specific situations and how much weight to give each criteria. Uh, and the enormous popularity of some of our services there has led us to think really hard about how to weigh that and how not to. Um, so thank you. Thank you. We have somebody over there has the microphone. Thank you. And if we can get the microphone over here to Wolfgang here, that would be good. Hello. Is this? There we go. Um, thanks very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, two things that are related. First, it seems like it's useful to break down the discussion into two layers when you're talking about how to manage these issues internationally. First, there's the question of the lever, which is what is the actual technical way in which we're going to get access to the speech that's in question or whatever the conduct is that crosses the border. And then there's the lever puller, which is the individual or the institution or the organization that uses or tries to get access to the information, to the conduct. And short of a significant shift in the architecture of the internet, companies like Google are going to remain the lever or an access point and an important access point. 
And it's interesting because everyone seems to agree that there's some concern there, including Google, which makes perfect sense because I think in the long term that, would be, that is concerning to everyone. So what I wanted to ask is, for, is, can anyone think of or could we talk about not necessarily alternative levers or ways of accessing it, but alternative lever pullers? So what international institutions or organizations do the panelists think would make sense to vest this decision making in, if there is one? And if there isn't, then how can we resolve this or what steps could we take to resolve this? Thanks. Anybody want to respond directly to that? Well, let's collect the questions, well, questions yeah, because I think that is a good way to go, if possible, because then we can do... Sorry? Who was it? Yes, people identify. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Nathaniel. I'm from the Information Society Project. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Yes, it would be good if people identify themselves. Um, we have Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Wolfgang Benedek, University of Graz, Austria. I first wanted to address myself to Miriam, and I think you have a point there uh, that we, fo uh, we see a situation where there is a kind of jurisdiction without judges. And uh, I think that there is a need to establish somehow due process or minimum standards of fair trial and maybe to inscribe this into codes or whatever, uh, codes of good conduct in order to solve this problem of hotlines and, and so on, which are dealing with uh, the issue of what can be seen on the internet and what not. Um, certainly they are also needed in order to uh, produce a decentralized approach uh, to, con uh, to a kind of surveillance of what appears in the internet, but uh, this can, uh, this needs uh, some legal counterpart. And uh, for the second point, I mean, uh, Bill said, I think very rightly, that power relations matter also in this respect. And I think the first step has always to be to recognize also the other jurisdiction, and not to say our jurisdiction is the better one, therefore yours will be ignored. And then uh, to go on the basis of cooperation. And this means finally to conclude agreements. Uh, exception could be when we face situations of order public, uh, meaning that uh, this is the exception, so to say. Uh, now, when it comes to, uh, to Google, I just wanted to know something you didn't mention, the efforts which are in the U.S. Congress but also in the European Parliament of a sort of blocking legislation which would uh, force you, so to say, not to contract uh, under certain conditions uh, like censorship and so on. So I would be interested uh, what about uh, this, if this has uh, any reality in it for the future. Uh, it's obviously uh, very problematic because it could mean that you will go out of business in certain countries if you fulfill those criteria. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, let me just say, I think we should wrap this session up by, um, by six o'clock, which would be half an hour over time, and I know people want to probably prepare for reception tonight and so on. So what I'm going to suggest is that there are a number of questions being raised for the panel. I'd like to grab the last five or six minutes for the panel in a little while to answer any questions that have raised and respond to any of the comments. But in the meantime, let's get as many comments in as we possibly can. We have Guru. Next. Power and uh, how does, I mean, how does, how does, how do we create mechanisms to look at this issue of too much power? And if you looked at the uh, power of the state in the past, and the state also had has a mechanism of exercising power arbitrarily, and the way we figured out was the way to counter it was to have established procedure by which the state would exercise its power. These procedures were transparent, known to people, and if there were problems with the state exercising power, there were procedures to address, you know, the, there was a grievance redressal procedure which can be the judiciary, independent of the executive, and then uh, there was also a participation in this whole mechanism, at least in democracies, participation of the people in mechanisms of deciding what these procedures are and should be. In the case of Google, I think that's the only solution. So long as Google doesn't, uh, I think the gentleman spoke about internally debated procedures, and that's a problem. So long as these procedures are internal and they're not transparent to the public, the public has no way of figuring out what is Google doing, not doing, who is it privileging, who is it not privileging, whether we should believe Google when it says that commercial interests don't dictate what comes on the first page when you do a Google search. I think that's, I think, so the answer to Google is rather simple in the sense that you have to follow the same principles that we follow in the political space for reducing the arbitrariness of the actor. 
the same principles that apply as far as Google is concerned, so that that also save Google the, I think uh, the dilemma that uh, Rishi presented in the beginning of Google having to negotiate with uh, nation states about following laws or f not following laws. I think that is not Google's responsibility to do at all. And I think uh, making its processes public tr and transparent and subject to debate is a necessary solution to this problem of power. Thank you, Guru. Uh, my name is uh, George Roman. I come from Sedechina, Romania, a uh, member of FinSafe. Uh, I will change a little bit the perspective, so, and I, I'll talk from the child's perspective. Uh, there is an important international tool which uh, has to be taken into consideration, and this is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, this uh, convention has been signed by uh, almost all countries, maybe it's the most ratified uh, convention in the world, with the exception of two countries. Uh, so uh, almost uh, all these countries agree to apply as such the provisions you know, in their internal law uh, and principles like uh, child protection against uh, any form of ex exploitation or responsibility of parents or uh, state uh, for the care of all children. These could be principles to be taken into account when we discuss about uh, internet regulation. Hmm. Um, so uh, I could say that the convention could be considered a transboundary tool, uh, a, a sort of, uh, of a word, con consensus, um, and on which we can build for child protection uh, course. The implementation of this convention includes not only uh, the physical uh, life, the real world, but it also uh, could be uh, taken uh, into discussion, uh, the digital one. The, the extension of this uh, real world. So my question, besides cybercrime convention of the uh, Council of uh, Europe, uh, is it convenient or efficient to consider this international framework uh, in promoting internet safety for children as an internet regulation? Thank you. Very important point where frameworks exist, I think. There's a gentleman just near you who's next, I think. Thank you, sir. I am uh, Elias Espinosa from the Philippines. I belong to the Deplo Foundation. Um, I would like to highlight the fact that the, the, on this workshop, we're talking about jurisdiction. Now, from my point of view as a practicing lawyer in my country, if we talk of jurisdiction, we're talking about prosecution. Now, most of the IPs are based in America. Any violation of the laws of a country, um, how can the courts acquire jurisdiction over these IPs? So, I think this workshop should look into how other countries for violation of its national laws pertaining to decency or uh, morality. Because most of the violation, particularly YouTube, there is one classic case in my, my country wherein the doctors and nurses were charged with violation of privacy when the operation uh, on um, the removal of a canister from the anus of a gay was uploaded in YouTube, then there was a case. Then how can the courts of the Philippines go after, or rather acquire jurisdiction over YouTube? Because it is not based in the, in the Philippines. So my, my point is jurisdiction on IPs from other countries which IPs do not hold office. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was there any other person desperately wanting to comment after this? Because otherwise, I think we might wrap up with the panel after this gentleman's comment. So we're happy with that. Hello, I'm Shrikant Patil. I'm Additional Commissioner of, of Customs with Government of India. Uh, I think we are facing a larger picture. When we talk about the sovereignty of country, it doesn't mean activity of a particular sector or particular company or particular enterprise or particular sector. Sovereignty is, is, a, such a, is a enormous concept. And but for the sovereignty, we could not have that much kind of nationalities and citizens in the country on this earth. So I mean, we, what we really, really looked at it, to how we can control the 
uh, internet or regulate the internet at the same time protect the sovereignty. Each state has being a sovereign, has its sovereign right. It cannot be compromised ideologically or physical assault. So it is a sovereign. So it, at a theoretical level or at a practical level or effectual level, it makes no difference when it you ideologically attack or physically attack. So each state has a sovereign right. So rather than talking about a microscopic issue on one company or one sector or one activity, what we really need to look at a larger picture, how we should design a mechanisms or systems which will help the state to ensure its sovereignty. And whatever the attendant functions related to sovereignty, how the state can discharge it, regardless of the level of development, whether it is a developed country or it's undeveloped country. That is my question. Thank you. That's a very, very key question, I think. Um, I'd like to start to wrap up, but um, thank you for all those comments. And um, I don't think um, the Internet Governance Forum has heard the last of transboundary issues. I think we have opened a can of worms that cannot be closed until people start to address it. But I think I'd invite all my panellists to make some closing remarks, perhaps in the order in which we started. So, Miriam. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, in this closing remark, uh, I think I, I would like most um, address and uh, maybe answer, I don't know, the gentleman from Brazil um, and uh, Volkang. Um, the, the principle of the country of origin is normally developed and applied for non-democratic country. But what happens is that in some democratic countries, you don't get the data that you are asking for, and in some non-democratic country, the data are disclosed, and here again, I uh, won't name uh, uh, any, any, any company. So the, the whole point, in my view, is to uh, provide and to assess if there are adequate safeguards, democratic safeguards, in the country. Okay. If the safeguards exist, then probably the data could be disclosed because it's, it will respect uh, due process, uh, etc. So this is the whole point. And to get back to the Cybercrime Convention, what we are witnessing is that this convention is more and more ratified by non-Council uh, of Europe uh, states, by third uh, uh, parties, without um, um, without extending the, 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 the adequate safeguard, which are already put in a convention in the same Council of Europe com convention, a convention on the protection of personal data and privacy. And it's quite clear that the Council of Europe is not putting the same amount of energy to promote this convention to the, for the respect of privacy than the, to promote uh, the, the, the Cyber Crime Convention. Uh, regarding uh, Volkan's question and the, the idea of uh, uh, codes of good conduct, uh, we, um, we haven't addressed a, a, new, a new initiative to, um, that has been uh, set up, which is the Global Network Initiative. So this is an initiative by private companies, big, uh, big companies in, in the area, and some uh, NGOs, some human rights organization, mainly US, US organization, uh, uh, I should say. But as far as I know, as far as I, I've read about this Global Network Initiative, this could be a good start. This could be a good tool, but provided uh, to uh, not to fall into the same traps, you know, as the Global Compact uh, set up by the UN. So what we really need, and I think we would agree on this, is a kind of international uh, committee or task force able to assess at least the situation in uh, different countries, the situation as uh, practiced by uh, different companies. Uh, of course, and this would be my last word, of course the IGF would have been the best arena to at least discuss this idea of an international task force, multi-stakeholder task force for assessing the situation. But, and uh, I am now uh, talking as a former um, Human Rights Caucus coordinator, coordinator during the, the WESIS, we have proposed since the very uh, beginning of uh, the IGF discussion, uh, when it was, uh, when the issue was how to set the 
the agenda for the IGF and this proposal of course we made this proposal and we was not we were not the only one to make this proposal but Strangely, the IGF, and I don't mean the secretary, I mean the IGF, so everyone, uh, have not found this uh, idea interesting. And now the question that we should ask ourselves is why this idea doesn't seem really interesting at the international level. Thank you. Richie. Sure. Um, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to participate, and thank you, everyone, for your uh, interest in Google. Uh, I mean, our point of view on all of this is evolving. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have seen a Google representative at this panel and, and put up a slide that says Googzilla on it ourselves, right? We are self-aware of what's going on, which is why I'm here in the first place. And, and a comment I make about not wanting the, th that's precisely why I say, I say those things so the conversation doesn't become a, a blame game, that you're too big. I know I'm too big. <laughs> so in this space, which is why I make the point in the first place. Um, and so uh, anyway, with that in mind, quickly kind of on, on some of these issues, um, on the, again, on the data protection and personalization issue, I, I would argue that we have the industry's best uh, practices when it comes to uh, anonymizing data uh, that we have and also not offering personalized services in markets where we think that user data is at risk. Uh, you, won't find, uh, you won't find an example like what we've seen with uh, Yahoo in China uh, with our company. But again, that's again an evolving uh, point of view. Uh, Regarding the question on the U.S., uh, the bills in the U.S. and the European Union, good questions. Um, while we appreciate those bill, the spirit of those bills, I think uh, the, what, what we found problematic for years is uh, just definitions. And we, we find that, uh, to no surprise to anyone here, lawmakers have a hard time understanding what actually constitutes uh, uh, data residing in a country, what constitutes, what does it mean to operate in a country, and we've had, a, and we found that bills like that would, as currently proposed, would end up being counterproductive to the goals of advancing information, flows of information worldwide. Um, to the really interesting suggestion about opening up our, our decision making and our processes, uh, that's precisely why I'm here. And I think your really creative suggestion about, you know, uh, creating a political process around Google is flattering because it, because it makes me feel like I represent some government organization here. But, but, uh, but it's interesting. And, <laughs> and, and it's a conversation worth having, and it, that's precisely why we're here. That's precisely why we allowed the New York Times to write uh, a nine-page article on our, on our processes. And uh, two years from now, I may be able to list for you some of the, some of the uh, decisions that go into our thinking. So I, I appreciate that suggestion. So the gentleman from the Philippines, I think your point really raises the important question of, you know, what do we do when we, don't have, we have nobody in the country? And it speaks to, and I appreciate it, it speaks to our need to ensure people around the world are familiar with our processes. How do you, how do you even get in touch with Google on a question like this? We Believe me, we hear every day how people, how, how much trouble they have navigating our organization. Um, I think I'll just uh, uh, leave it at that. But again, just, just I hope everyone appreciates the, uh, the challenge of, of being Google in this kind of, uh, in this kind of scenario. Um, and um, you know, what I've tried to articulate here is kind of a self-awareness of that and, and trying to move the needle on transparency. And uh, I hope a year or two from now at the final IGF, the next IGF, we can, we can be even farther down the line. Thank you so much, Mary. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me wrap up with uh, two points. Um, the first one is that I really enjoyed the questions and the comments, and I, I think it just reinforces how important, interesting, and complex uh, this issue is. And I think it also, the questions also underscored the distinctions, and they may be subtle, but they are there, I promise you, between jurisdiction, uh, control, and sovereignty. Um, jurisdiction it may often be shared between uh, governments. Um, control may or may not exist, and when it does exist, uh, it's a question of who, in a shared jurisdiction context, should exercise the control, if, if any of the party. And, and sovereignty we already discussed, it sometimes gets confused with these issues, and states feel that their sovereignty is somehow challenged or questioned, um, when it's not. It exists no matter what, irrespective of how these issues are, are handled. Um, my second comment is uh, that um, 
I, I hope tomorrow in uh, a panel on mainstreaming human rights to focus a little bit more on the global network uh, initiative, which I, I have a copy of, and it's readily available online for those that are interested, um, because it really is an interesting example of how uh, private sector, NGOs, uh, I think prodded by governments, it would be fair to say, some governments at least, the U.S. government, um, have uh, come up with a creative solution. And they're very much norms, not binding uh, uh, details or any kind of international obligation. And it's often easier to negotiate, develop these kinds of norms than it is to try to move in the direction of hard law. Um, so I think this is a really productive way for us to um, try to, to move uh, and mark progress on these questions. And I think it was Bill who pointed out the very definition of internet governance uh, that we have in Tunis um, talks about developing shared norms. And they don't have to be legally binding rules. We don't have to have the sovereigns you know, immediately clashing or trying to come up with legally binding arrangements that may never actually come to fruition or be implemented. But I think together in, in this multi-stakeholder community, we can try to fashion norms that work in specific situations and can really uh, represent a step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And Bill, closing with us. Um, I guess my main point would be, uh, I wasn't kidding, Rishi, you are juicy. And uh, <laughs> the, I think there were a couple of questions that weren't for Google. Um, let me just respond to a couple of points, I guess. Wolfgang, um, if I understood you correctly, did you say that states should all just recognize each other's jurisdiction? Okay. Um, I, I would not be for that, um, and for a reason I think that Miriam alluded to as well, um, you know, states are highly va variable in the, the quality and character of their legal processes. And one of the reasons you have uh, mutual law enforcement agreements that are entered into by states is they choose their partners. Um, would uh, you necessarily want a democratic uh, industrialized country to fee be automatically obliged to enter into a uh, mutual uh, law enforcement agreement with Burma. Maybe you would, but I don't quite trust the Burmese legal system to exercise due process. So the point is, the, the, the granting of that kind of recognition is a political act and it's based in part on a judgment on, on the kind of quality of cooperation and protections that are going to apply you know, across uh, borders. And I think we have a fairly piecemeal set of mutual uh, legal recognition agreements out there precisely because of that. People are going to make those kinds of choices. And if you want to say that you, we should have a global thing that would harmonize across all states given the wide ver variety of circumstances that obtain across countries, probably you'd end up with a real least common denominator thing that wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on. So I think that the, the long-term solution has to be to continue to promote rule of law and democracy around the world and in that context to encourage closer cooperation at the judicial level, et cetera. But I'm not sure that I would upfront want to mandate that there should be such cooperation amongst all on a non voluntary basis. Um, Nathaniel asked about what international institution would make sense to try to tackle these issues. Again, the, the multilateral efforts to tackle just pieces of this puzzle, like e-contracting and so on, or choice of law in the Hague uh, Convention, have proven very, very difficult. And very often what we've seen happen is that once the negotiations started, parties that started out saying, yes, we really want to have this, once they started to understand what it really might imply, went, ooh, wait, maybe we don't want this, and pulled back. I mean, the U.S. just swept, switched its position on the Hague uh, process precisely because of that. It's very, very difficult. There isn't any existing framework out there that really would be applicable, but I would, uh, per Merriam, be all for seeing some sort of more informed multi-stakeholder task force or something, try to at least generate some ideas about this. It should be said, again, the lawyers are all, all, all over this stuff. The problem is, you know, per Shakespeare, first we kill all the lawyers. I'm not sure that you want to 
have just the lawyers sorting out these questions. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, apologies to all lawyers, but I mean, I'm just saying, you know, I wouldn't, you know, if you read the, the legal literature on jurisdiction, you want to like jump out a window after a few minutes. Um, so these issues cannot all be handled purely through the questions that the legal community would raise, and that's why I think some broader multi-stakeholder engagement on a transparent and inclusive basis would be very useful. Thanks, Bill, which actually raises, um, I, I wanted to make two points in closing, but that actually raises the very first one, and um, I think the only way to do this is by a quick show of hands. Um, one of the mechanisms that exists within IGF for multi-stakeholder work on issues like this is to set up a dynamic coalition. A dynamic coalition would only be effective if it had industry people like Google, had government representatives, had some of the um, human rights interest groups and so on all involved working together. Is there interest, just a quick, is there interest in doing this thing between, between the next IGF? Yeah, hands. Not in the framework of a, of a dynamic coalition. It's not a yes or no question. What's the subject? Yeah, exactly. Maybe it's, uh, well, I don't know. I'm asking you. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm just suggesting that I think the interchange might be a useful thing, and it would be, uh, I certainly do not wish to, wish to head it. I must make that clear, but it would be a, um, uh, um, it would be a dynamic coalition on transboundary issues or something, I think, along those lines. Why, why, is that what they, why is that not what the internet, the internet government's got to suit us? The Internet Governors Caucus is a civil society group. It doesn't have private sector or government involvement. So, yes, we do address this. It does have. Mm. It does have people from ICANN and mm -hmm. it could have others. I'll leave it to that side, but if people feel that this is something that you really want to do, just come up once, uh, once we've closed the session. If there are enough people interested, we'll see if we can do something within 10 minutes to set up a mailing list or something like that. Let's just sort of see if that's got legs or whether it doesn't or not. I did want to make one other comment too, which is on the question of rights. And um, I, I certainly heard human rights many times, the rights of children. Um, these are all big issues, and the Internet Governance Caucus has been pressing and will continue to press, and we urge you to join us to make rights a major theme for the next IGF the, um, session in Cairo. Exactly what that means and what form that takes. I hear applause, thank you. <laughs> We'd certainly like to see that happen and we would urge you to take that up with the Secretariat, take that up through um, uh, anybody you know who's able to make influence, make announcements on that because that would be a key. My only other thing I wanted to do is to thank an absolutely brilliant panel for so many excellent inputs and so many different perspectives on this very complex subject. Um, I, I found it enormously helpful. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please. Can I add something? Yeah. Um, I don't want to preempt the chair, but you, your last comment was really provocative and interesting, and I, I regret we didn't have a chance to discuss it. Um, and maybe tomorrow, uh, some of the workshops we will, but um, the notion, I was at a very interesting workshop or forum yesterday uh, that started off talking about rights, and some people made the point that, you know, if we talk about values, we're more likely to find greater common ground. Uh, if you move the discussion from values to principles, you might lose a few people, but hopefully there's still uh, a, a basis um, for common discussion. Um, but then when you move to the question of rights, uh, it's very hard to exclude the lawyers, and when you bring them in, uh, <coughs> lawyers, uh, governments, and others um, will start to want a lot more specificity, a right to what, and uh, how, you know, where does that right exist, and how do you enforce it all, and you may lose a lot of the people that you could otherwise bring along in more of a norm or value-based discussion. So I just want to offer that mm. uh, response to what I, I think was an interesting comment, and unfortunately, we don't have time to, to discuss no, it. No, but we certainly got the lawyers in quick, didn't we? <laughs> thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank you to the panel. You might want to discuss that. And thank you all for coming. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Issue. I've heard it in different contexts and it really has been a concern. I've seen it too. Thanks, government.